The Unshackled Waves, episode 203. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, glad to have you here for this rather somber show. We are reeling from an Islamic terror attack that has happened in Melbourne CBD last Friday the 9th of November, which killed one person, injured two, and had the terrorist shot dead by police. New South Wales Labor opposition leader Luke Foley resigned this week after a female ABC journalist put out a statement detailing sexually inappropriate conduct she experienced from him. While he did resign, he also vowed to sue the ABC for publishing the allegations. And Mark Latham has announced he has joined Pauline Hanson's One Nation and will be their upper house candidate at the New South Wales state election in March 2019. To discuss the implications of all these developments, I am joined tonight by both the editor-at-large of The Unshackled, Steel Archer, the political editor of The Unshackled, Michael Smythe, and senior editor of The Unshackled, Damien Ferry, for a special roundtable episode. So let's bring everyone in. Now, I'll introduce everybody one by one. So we have in Canberra, uh, Steel Archer, welcome. Hi, welcome from Canberra. Uh, thanks for having me back on, Tim. And we've got uh, Michael Smythe in, up in Brisbane. Good evening, Tim, live from Brisbane. And we've got uh, Damien Ferry in the Illawarra, or is that too specific a location? No, that sounds good, Tim. Good to be here, mate. All right, so we've got the, the, the four of us tonight, the, the statesmen of the Unshackled. So well, let's start by talking about uh, what is probably the uh, biggest uh, story and um, uh, greatest tragedy uh, to happen in Australia recently, and that is the, the Melbourne terror attack that occurred on 4.20pm on Friday afternoon, November uh, the, the 9th. Uh, now, it was in, in Burke Street, what happened is that a four-wheel drive, uh, it was armed with gas cylinders, uh, crashed uh, in uh, Burke Street, and then uh, three people who went to went over to the car to see what was happening. A African man uh, came out and he stabbed through them. He then tried to uh, stab uh, police before. Thankfully, he was shot by by one of them. Now, uh, this uh, uh, it all unf uh, unfolded quite quickly. Uh, uh, police uh, were praised for for their response, and and thankfully the, the, this. Uh, terrorist, he only uh, uh, managed to injure and as later kill uh, uh, one person. Now, uh, we got some information from the police at 6 p.m. who uh, who they outlined uh, who had been injured, and that, at that time they said there were no known links to uh, terrorism, but they had an open mind. But then the, the leaks started coming out of the uh, police HQ uh, that this uh, African man who would carried out this attack, he did have uh, links to, to terrorism. Uh, he was being monitored by ASIO. He knew uh, terror suspects. And then by 8.30 p.m. we had that confirmed by another president press conference with Police Commissioner Graeme Ashton and uh, caretaker Premier at the moment because there's a state election on uh, Daniel Andrews. And then, of course, the, the next day we learnt the, the name of the uh, perpetrator, uh, which uh, was, if I get it here, uh, Hassan Shire Ali. And we learnt that he was inspired by Islamic State, uh, had his passport cancelled in 2015 uh, because he planned to fight in the Syrian uh, civil war and Islamic State, they did claim responsibility for the attack. Uh, Ali, he died in hospital later on that Friday afternoon. Nobody's too sad that that happened. And uh, he was of uh, Somali descent and he is for, uh, he arrived here in the 1990s and his family members uh, were known to authorities on terror related matters. And it, uh, it seemed to fit a familiar pattern of not Australian, not just Australian terror incidents, but all throughout the West that the, the perpetrator, the terrorist is always known to authorities and yet this attack happens. I think I think I should jump in on, on, on the whole point of it being known. 
uh, just very briefly, because the Sydney siege, uh, the Lynn Cat episode, which was exactly the same thing, uh, was exactly the same thing. ASIO knew they had double checked. They checked and checked again, and they didn't. They didn't do anything about it. I don't know if this is political correctness gone mad because they don't want to be seen as racist or or there's other agendas going on here. But the, the ASIO does know about these things. They're, they're claiming that oh, because we have encrypted apps, because people are you know functioning on encrypted apps, they can't get into these people's heads, into their minds. I'm not so sure. A lot of these people broadcast this in very public ways on Facebook and social media, which is which is you know the the Sydney Siege Guard had 42 uh, calls to the national hotline before before this went out. So uh, I you know I'm going to throw it over to Dan or or, or uh, Michael Smythe, but uh, this that this ASIO knew, and it's it's terrible. Well, personally, I think that it's a disgrace that we have such a system in place that the government, that our agencies aren't on top of these things. I mean, we can always put the blame on the individuals, these lone wolves, they go and uh, do these these uh, heinous attacks. But at the end of the day, where are the people that are supposed to be overseeing these things? Um, I mean, they're supposed to basically be there and they've already been... Um, They've already come out and said that, like you you mentioned before, that they have been on on the list of people that they were watching. So if this is the case, why is it that these people are always um, allowed to to basically partake in these activities? I mean, I just don't understand it. I mean, this is the problem we have here. We have too many people that aren't doing their job. Their job is supposed to be in keeping Australians safe and they're failing because instead of keeping us safe, they, for, if, for whatever reason, I don't know if it is a political correctness thing or if there is anything uh, um, else, like you mentioned, that, that is in play here. But at the end of the day, people want to be safe on our streets. That is what's important here. And they are failing miserably at that job. Absolutely. I have to agree with that. It, they... You know, this should not have happened. The Lind Cafe siege a few years ago should not have happened. The terrorist attack, let's call a spade a spade, it was a terrorist attack, even if it was a lone wolf or whether it was ISIL, it doesn't matter. It was still a terrorist attack. If you have a pattern of behaviour from someone who is deemed a sympathiser, you start watching them a lot more closely. You start monitoring when they go to the toilet, you start monitoring what they eat. When they go to sleep, you follow their routines and you make sure that, they, that when the slightest deviation from said routine occurs, you question them. Now, a friend of mine actually made the comment to me the on the night of the attack and he said, what, so we start, should we start locking up people without charge now? And I said, well, no. The point, the, what I was pointed out to him both privately and publicly on my Facebook is that what we, what ASIO, AFP, etc., what we need to do, what they need to do rather, is ensure that any deviations from routines are noted and that people are protected. So, you know, I mean, it's a fine line between detaining people for questioning and uh, arresting them without charge. There is a fine line, but sometimes you have to be safe. I mean, this person was radicalized. He was clearly radicalized after having done pretty much nothing since he arrived in 1990. But the fact is people can change very quickly. Could ASIO have done better? Well, they could have certainly highlighted that the guy was a security risk, which, in fairness, I believe they did when they confiscated his passport so he couldn't fly to Syria to fight with the Islamic State against the legitimate Syrian government. I remember However, Peter Dutton uh, uh, today said that uh, authorities didn't 
believed that he was going to carry out an imminent attack. And of course, uh, people like to think that the police state can monitor uh, all these people 24 or 7. The reality, they can't. They're, there's only they're, yeah. there's more people to, to monitor than there is uh, officers. So they've got to obviously prioritize. And of course, in this case, they thought that uh, this uh, Ali uh, person was of low uh priority and and that's that's the uh judgment decision they make but it always comes back to me that we wouldn't need to have this massive build up of uh police and intelligence billions of dollars has been poured into uh, counterterrorism for so many years if we just stopped importing people from these trouble countries i mean uh, somalia even though it's in africa it's a, a muslim country i think it was one of the ones covered in trump's travel ban and it all comes back to immigration tim that's a good point that's and you know granted but at the same time like i said if you've got a pattern of problematic behavior antisocial and potentially seditious behavior you don't just say oh it's not a low it's not a high enough priority for us to you know watch this guy you watch him like a hawk it's that simple yes it's going to cost money yes it's going to tax resources but had they, had they done that and a lot of people that i've spoken to have said that they agree with me on this you you take the steps to stop them from engaging in such antisocial activity and this is me being polite by the way me calling it antisocial activity you were saying steel so I actually agree with Damien that I think this was a lone wolf attack. I think that ISIS probably wasn't behind this. It doesn't. It's not a very sophisticated attack. This man's life, if you look into it, it started to spiral out of control. He started having relationship issues with his uh, with his wife, and he was having fights, and he his life was spiraling downhill. I, I think Damien's right on that. And what Michael said uh, about you know cancelling with a passport. Uh, where they cancelled his passport so he couldn't go to, to Syria. I said on this show, I'm pretty sure it was either on the show or I've written about it, send them to Syria and don't let them come back. You know, we, we've, we've held them here in a bottle and these ISIS, ISIS sympathizers, these terrorist sympathizers, whoever they are, and we haven't allowed them to go out into the world because our laws are such that if they did go out and commit terrorism and, and, and fight in rebel armies across the, the surface of the globe, then they be allowed back because of our democracy. I said, let them go, don't let them come back. But now we've kept these people here because of our laws. And look what you get. You get, uh, what is it, like one or two dead people now? Yeah, 100% like still. That, yes. 100%, mm. mate. I, I definitely believe that if anybody was willing or wanting to go overseas to fight, send them and only a one-way ticket, make sure they don't come back. Because at the end of the day, if they are so motivated in going over there and fighting for this cause of theirs, I'd rather them fight over there than fight on our streets. Because we have to look in what is in our best interest here. We would rather them be anywhere but on our streets and hurting our people. That's what's important here. Also on this issue, um, firstly on immigration, I think we definitely, it's not only a religious issue, I think it goes further than that. I think that um, if you look at Melbourne um, in particular, but then also other areas, the main uh, group of people seem to be sub-Saharan Africans. And they have a very, very difficult time fitting in. I'm not saying that all of them are like that. I know a couple that are all right. But at the end of the day, we have to really look at who we're bringing over here and say, well, why aren't we bringing people that are going to easily easily fit in because at the end of the day it doesn't only do us harm but it does their harm themselves harm because if they're coming to our country and we have a totally different set of values to them at the end of the day that also makes their life difficult and it also so so i mean it's not only an issue that it's causing havoc for us but it's also making it hard for them i mean we should technically be if you want to go for Africans, the white South African farmers, for instance. But I mean, we have any we have a really deep issue on immigration that needs to be sorted. And I think, to be fair, that we shouldn't be 
having any immigrants coming in until we get our country fixed. I mean, look at the the people like the trolley man, for instance, homeless. We could be helping. Yeah, him who him through the and trolley uh, and in front uh, yeah. of um, yeah. of the attacker. It just obviously the the it seemed like there were the the police. They they kept walking away, and so this homeless person just threw the 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 trolley uh, in front as a, as a way to to stop him. A, a, a good reflex instinct. That's right, and I mean, why aren't we helping people like that that are already living here rather than trying to save the world and help everybody overseas? Another one thing that I want to bring up too is when you uh, were talking um, earlier about priority, why is it that there's such a priority from either ASIO or a lot of these other um, the governments and all sorts to all of a sudden look at neo-Nazi groups or alt-right groups and, you know, basically, you know, full on look and, and, and try and police everything that they're doing, every action they're doing and make a big story out of every single thing, even though they're harmless, these people, um, and have not committed any violent attacks in this country or anything, instead of looking at the people that are committing the, the violent attacks in this country. I mean, they're focused on the wrong people. They're not prioritizing the, the people properly. I mean, you know... Um, when, when you have a country that all of a sudden looks at people with right-wing beliefs as as um, a much worse sort of state than the actual people perpetrating violence, I mean, th this is w what we're in here. I mean, this, this is terrible, and they have to sort out their priorities. Yeah, the mm -hmm. left uh, are definitely uh, disappointed that the the terrorist uh, wasn't white, and of course now oh, the, the the most important way for for them to react is to say, oh, you shouldn't uh, exploit this tragedy to to be racist. Of course, only the left are allowed to uh, exploit tragedies like uh, Yuri Dixon's murder to say that uh, all men uh, are are to blame, but. This is the, the fifth uh, Islamic inspired in ter terror attack in four years in Australia, and it's the third deadly incident in Melbourne CBD in the past two years. And a lot of people are saying, what is happening to uh, Melbourne, given that this is an all two uh, occurrence? And of course, there's uh, uh, sadly the, the person that who, who lost their life, uh, Sisto uh, Malus Spina, he was uh, one of the co owners of Pellegrini. Uh, cafe, a, a popular uh, place in, in, in Melbourne, and of course there's been a lot of tributes to him saying he's one of the nicest people uh, yeah, you could ever meet, and of course he went to help uh, Ali when he got out of the car, he thought that th this was a crash and got stabbed to death uh, for his trouble, I mean he was 74 years old, he'd lived a good life, but yeah, it's still horrific that, and there's been uh, not just the memorial at the crash site, but also a, a, a memorial at the, the Pellegrini's restaurant, which is uh, closed and until Monday morning. Mm. I actually have something to add in regards to Damien's point as well. Uh, when Damien pointed out that Antifa and your far left uh, organizations aren't being looked at and um by by ASIO, AFP, etc. Instead they're focusing on um neo Nazi groups and alt right groups. Now neo Nazis are a much smaller smaller minority than the um than the Islamic population, for example. I mean because no no serious person is actually a neo Nazi. Neo Nazis are anathema to polite society. But the problem is by focusing on alt right groups, let's just say alt right groups in general, rather than on religious terrorism like radical islam or uh, sorry radical islamic terrorism or hardline socialist terrorism like antifa and socialist alternative socialist alliance etc all that all their ilk they're actually radicalizing in a weird way the mainstream center to go towards the right so people are slowly becoming more how do i put this people are slowly becoming more amenable to considering, even if not accepting, alt-right ideas because the government isn't doing anything about the problems of radical Islam, the problems of unfettered immigration, the problems of you know, people 
unable to integrate properly into the society. Now, charity begins at home. We've got to remember that charity begins at home and we need to take care of our own before we can take care of everyone else. Because if we, if we try to do it all at once, we're not going to take care of anyone and everyone's going to be unhappy, disenfranchised, and things are going to get a lot worse than they are now. So the AFP is right. Oh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm probably going to draw a bit of flack here, but the AFP is right to look at neo-Nazis and even at some alt-right groups. But the standard has to be applied to the left as well. You can't just look at, you can't just pick on one fringe group without looking at the other fringe groups. I mean, you've still got Hezbollah Tahrir hasn't been blacklisted as a terrorist organization yet, for example. Remember that... um. Festival of Dangerous Ideas a few years ago when the spokesperson was saying, oh, yeah, it should be okay to beat your wives and stuff uh, like honor that. Honor killings. Other... That honor kill oh, yeah, killings honor that killings, justify. Sorry. Yeah, uh, honor killings justified. And they were arguing yes. And even the ABC of all places took them to task over it. Their, um, their spokesperson um, took their spokesman to task over it. And it's just, you know... And the ABC actually did a better job at exposing the dangers of radical Islam than our own security services and our own police services, which is sad. You know, we, we've 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 got to we've got to fix this mess. We've got to fix this mess. We can't keep, and this is going on to another of Damien's earlier point, with which I'm pretty sure we all agree. We can't let everyone in. We have to take people who are capable of integrating into our culture and edifying our society. If they're not capable of integration, we, we, we can't have room for them. We can't just keep letting them in. And people are starting to wake up to that slowly, granted, but they are starting to wake up to it. And we need, we need a government to quite quite frankly, just say, no, you can't come in because you do not conform to Australian values. That's what we need. Oh, and incidentally, if the people in Victoria vote Labor back in in two weeks, they deserve more of what happened on Friday. And I feel really horrible saying that. But the fact is, a Labor government, has, has, the Labor government that has existed in the past four years has presided over all of the attacks that have happened well there's that famous uh, quote that, from that's... daniel andrews in in 2015 where uh this was before all these attacks began he said our oh, violent extremism is just part and parcel of living in a a major city i have to weigh in on this i, I think the victorian government has been absolutely atrocious i think uh i think they owe uh mr uh Mr. Malisplania, uh, however you say that his name, uh, the, the the cafe shop owner, I think they owe him uh, more than an apology. I think I think there should be a memorial. Well, they're uh, giving built. him a state funeral, so they've yeah. Uh, well, they well they he deserve he deserves it because he, he's a victim of their social experiment, an experiment that exactly. we've called out on this show for years and years, and we've put forward positive ideas and positive solutions to rectifying these and. And they have, that's the only option they have. The, Daniels, the Daniel Andrews government must be thrown out. They have blood on their hands mm. to this mm. crazy social experiment. Do you, uh, do you guys yeah, actually yeah. think that this particular event might um, affect uh, the Victorian state election coming up by any chance? No. It I mean, or two, though. Uh, 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 two, though. Yeah, you would think so, so but that, it you know, won't. Mm. I mean, there was oh, okay. this hilarious uh, meme. Uh, 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 I, I, sh I shouldn't say, I uh, will give this uh, probably timely meme where it, it lists all of da Daniel Andrews' crimes uh, over the past four years. You know, I, bu I blew a uh, billion dollars not to build a ro road. I, I stole money from the taxpayer. Uh, I introduced this uh, safe schools uh, program teaching your kids about gender fluidity. Uh, I let all these violent home invasions uh, happen. Uh, uh, people uh, drive, uh, run people down in the street and then 
and it has you know the the good fellas laughing and then and people st still voted for me that is pretty much it if if the past four years hasn't had an effect on the voters at at the moment, I don't. I I still think that Daniel Andrews is still the favourite. He'll he'll still get back in. He's he's trying to get union power behind him because uh, that that's the way that this government functions. It builds up anger. It it it, uh, it moves the union movements, uh, and then and then that's how they maintain their power. It's not about all these other issues. It's it's about the unions. It comes back to the unions. So. We've had some reaction from political leaders. Daniel Andrews said it was an evil act. Uh, yeah, no shit. And uh, Scott Morrison said that uh, we we need to uh, tackle violent uh, Islamic extremism. It's the biggest threat to Australia and Islamic leaders need to uh, call it out. Now, I really hate uh, when I see like right-wing people on their timeline say, oh, after every take, we need to talk about Islam. Like, oh, you just figured that out now? What, do you want to like meddle? It's basically just a virtue signal. Like, look, I discovered this problem and i want to start a conversation about it i am we're a bit beyond that now i mean i've been talking about islam for the past seven years and i've often been met with scorn and say well thank you for coming around uh to that right now but we need to have a bit more of a conversation and and talk about uh action now uh jason wood who's a government backbencher he wants uh the, the government to uh, deport uh, terror uh, uh, people under terror watch list if they've got uh, dual citizen or uh, are not uh, sole citizens. But we've also seen uh, Ann Ali, who's uh, a WA Labour MP. She's a counterterrorism expert. She's a, a Muslim uh, of Egyptian background, but she doesn't wear their hijab. She said that oh, the, the government's uh, exploiting uh, this to uh, whip up hysteria. Well, of course she'd say that, wouldn't she? She's worried about I'm, I'm posts. Uh, it's okay to be white posters outside her office. That's the real terror. Yeah, that's the real terror. Ooh. Call the authorities. Call the police. What someone, what someone think of the children? Come on. I mean, let, 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 let's, let's, be, let's be honest here. Now, nobody rational or logical will think that because this ha this happened on Friday, that all Muslims are the problem. No, we don't think that, or at least I certainly don't. It's the ideology that's the problem, which is why Scott Morrison correctly pointed out there is a problem with radical Islam and it must be combated. It it's really that simple. You know, you, you can't... Ha I mean, Islam, and I hate to say this, but Islam as an ideology, the way it is enacted in a lot of islamic countries around the world is completely antithetical to western civilization be it christian or post-christian or purely secular humanist it is antithetical and you know there are a lot of muslims who are good people despite the ideology they would never dream of hurting a fly much less anyone else but then there are the few people who decide you know what I'm going to go for the greater jihad. I need to make something out of my life. And I'm going to go down in a blaze of glory and get my 72 virgins and kill as many infidels as possible. You know, unfortunately, there are some people who are like that. Granted, most of them are mentally ill. But then at what stage do you say, oh, is he mentally ill? Or is she mentally ill? Or... Was this a premeditated decision to go out and attack and hurt innocent people? But I'd be actually quite interested to see what the um, uh, what the Council of Imams, or sorry, the Council of Imams and Sheikhs would actually say to condemn this attack that happened on Friday. I know, I know. With the whole uh, the, the whole greens thing, with it's okay to be white posters. What a, what a waste of resources! I mean, Daniel and Ferry brought it up before. Uh, you know that the basically they're going around looking uh, the wrong areas in the wrong in the wrong. They're looking in in corners of of the cupboard that don't that don't need to be looked into. And and you know, 
uh, it's okay to be white poster. I mean, this was a piece of uh, a piece that was pushed through the, the Senate. I mean, the, 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 this is a legitimate statement saying it's okay to have, you know, racial and cultural and, uh, uh, you know, and pride in, in affiliations. It's, it's, it's not, it's not some sort of, it's not a bomb. It's not a, it's not some sort of instrument of terror or anything like that. So it's a huge waste of time. It's a huge, it's a non, uh, it's a non argument, but yet you, you've got uh, people over here wasting, wasting police resources, wasting time like the greens, uh, running around chasing phantoms in the dark. Mm, exactly right. I couldn't have said it any better myself. Yeah, and it's it's always uh, as I mentioned before that the left they 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 always fear after a terrorist attack they 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 don't fear for the safety of their fellow citizen they fear for their backlash against the minority community but I think I mentioned this uh, last week uh, uh, the the four corners special on uh, Victoria's African crime wave all they could uh, cu uh, come up with to say that. Uh, uh, Su uh, Sudanese youths are getting stigmatized is I get looked funny on public transport I get followed in the supermarket like it, it wasn't anything like there's no you know vigilante like you know there's no Nazi gangs going out uh, be beating up uh, Sudanese or in, or in this case Somali men it just Australians are just not like that I, I mean they want something to be done for sure and they're angry when it happened but yeah they they know <laughs> that it's just stupid to if you see somebody of a certain faith or, or race it's it's stupid to just if uh, a stranger you don't know to think that they're bad. Mm, mm, exactly. I mean, you know, and I, I think I made this comment a few weeks back as well when we were discussing the statistics of the crime waves in Victoria. Tim, if if you people are looking at you in a certain way, either stop being so insecure and defensive, or fit in simple you know fit in integrate if you think people are looking at you funny ask yourself why they are looking at you in a funny way maybe they're not maybe it's just all in their heads you know i mean you know i mean you know if i walk down the street people look at me walking past i don't think oh he or she looked at me funny neither do you neither does any normal person you know, unless you've got food on your face that you didn't wipe off from eating <laughs> lunch or, you know, you're wearing soiled or dirty clothes, in which case, you know, or you've had a bird um, drop on you or, you know, or your clothes are dirty or whatever, you know, or you have really bad BO and you haven't showered because you haven't had time or you just and don't how, have to how could how could <laughs> how could melbourne win the most livable city in the world and yet still have but it's not anymore that's going. the thing it's not i think it's down to about six now it's it's going down well yeah it's gonna it's gonna keep falling isn't it i mean it's 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 a it's a crackpot under under this andrews regime but uh, you know this, this this doesn't make sense and and you know we we have a, a, a certain thing it's called culture it's called values and and white societies across the globe have been very very generous in trying to integrate and allow people of different faiths and re religions and, uh, from every corner of the world to come into their countries and get on with the job and most do and most do uh, fantastic but the the ones who are left on the outside i'm i mean like let's say the sudanese it, it's 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 a problem because they well like like Damien said I think you know Donald Trump said they're not sending their best you know they, that's that's what he said on immigration they're not sending their best I mean if you get someone of those certain characteristics and they come here and everybody else is sort of you know had former cultural experiences and and uh, with and then these guys have been plucked out of the bush you know uh, or, or you know wherever they are in the, the horn of africa there the desert you know it, it it obviously it's going to be awful for them i mean trying to now integrate into a highly technologically advanced you know super multicultural society um you know it's it's not it doesn't add up i mean it's, why why do we have to pluck these people out of the bush in the first place send them back to the bush mm, exactly you know and 
Uh, actually, this is possibly diverting a little bit, but I think it was Stefan Molyneux, of all people, who made the comment that we in the West sort of have this tendency towards pathological altruism. We automatically presume that because our way is so superior that anyone can get it, but it's not that simple, unfortunately. And like you said, still, there are people on the fringes, people who just refuse to integrate, people who refuse to obey our laws, uphold our values, and basically integrate in. There are a lot of people who refuse to do that. You know, I mean, uh, Tim pointed out before what he probably correctly, but perhaps a little unfairly called uh, right-wing virtue signaling when people are saying it's time we had a conversation about Islam. I mean, Andrew Bolt has been talking about this for 15 years. Andrew Bolt, he's not even a Christian, but he's been talking about it for 15 years. It's always been in the back of my mind for almost as long. And there's several other people who have been thinking about it for more than just, you know, since two days ago. Uh, but no one... It's not a polite conversation to have, it seems, that we have to do something about the problem of unfettered immigration. We have to do something about Islamic immigration. That's not a conversation that people want to have because it offends their sensibilities. They think, oh, it's impolite. We can't say that. We can't talk like that because they'll be called a racist or a bigot or a xenophobe or something. But at the end of the day, gentlemen, what it comes down to is a phobia is something that is irrational or unjustified. We have a very good reason to be afraid of radical Islam in this country, as does every other non-Islamic country. Every non-Islamic country has a very good and logical reason to be concerned about radical Islam. I'll tell you who's probably thankful that this uh, terrorist attack happened. Uh, that is a former New South Wales Labor opposition leader, Luke Foley, because the day before on the Thursday, he uh, resigned the the leadership. Uh, this was after uh, there had been, in the media, it was discussed that he had uh, been sexually inappropriate with an ABC journalist at a uh, press gallery uh, Christmas party back in uh, 2016. Now, the, uh, the woman who um, uh, this incident was alleged to have happened with Folly. She came forward, uh, Ashley uh, Raper, to uh, in a statement that was uh, published on the the ABC website, where uh, sh uh, sh she went into quite uh, graphic uh, detail about what happened. Uh, the statement read, and of course we have to put in alleged. Uh, all those disclaimers. Uh, Foley put his hand uh, through a gap in the back of my dress and inside my underpants. He rested his hands on my buttocks. I completely froze. And the, the incident was witnessed by another journalist, Sean Nichols, who agreed to keep it in the, the strictest of confidence. Now, she wanted it. Uh, she, she didn't want this to become public because she didn't want to be known as a... a, a a victim, that woman who uh, would be defined by just this one uh, incident. She said she 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 never wanted to make this statement. Uh, a woman who is subject of uh, such behaviour is often the person who suffers the the most. Um, but she still believed that women should be go able to go about their professional lives and socialize without being subject to this sort of behavior and for it to be used in parliament for the sake of political points scoring because the whole reason this became a huge media story was because david elliott a berejiklian government minister uh, mentioned it under uh, parliamentary privilege and of course luke foley uh has denied that the incident uh, ever uh, took place and he threatened to sue any media outlet that uh, repeated uh, what Elliot said uh, in Parliament. And now apparently Foley uh, phoned uh, Raper uh, on the uh, last week uh, on, on Melbourne Cup Week to say he would uh, resign the Labor leadership he set and he's uh, alleged to have have, se have, have said to her, I'm not a groper, I'm just a drunk idiot. And let's remember, he has three uh, DUIs, uh, Luke Foley, as well. So there's a pattern with 
uh, alcohol. Now, uh, he, when he announced, everyone was expecting on the Thursday a resignation uh, speech, but then he said that they're false and that I'm uh, going to sue for defamation. He didn't say if he was going to sue uh, Ashley Raper or the ABC uh, or both, and everyone was just completely taken aback. Or, uh, uh, because that he would actually sue a alleged victim and it just to me it just summed up wow um we've dodged a bullet with this guy damien you're the um new south wales uh, person here what did you make because you actually quite liked luke foley uh for a while he was sort of old school labor but this stuff well that's right him i mean um as soon as this came out I well, I, two things went through my head actually. The first thing I thought was, was that if it was something that wasn't reported at the time, then at the end of the day, no crime was committed. I mean, if this was a serious issue, if this thing even happened was a serious issue, then she would have went and reported it. And as she said, she was happy to not re not report it at all and not make it a big deal. So at the end of the day, um, I think it was um, it was a bit of an opportunistic uh, thing to do for a uh, Berejiklian uh, minister to come out and actually um, spill the beans on such an issue. I thought if he was really wanting to um, hit the party hard, he might have even uh, left it till early next year, closer to election, and that would have even been worse for Labor. But, I mean, the second issue as well that I want to get to is if Luke Foley um, is true and in what he says that he didn't commit the, the crimes or, or this uh, alleged act, so to speak, then why would he resign? I mean, if he um, hasn't got any dirt um, on him and he definitely is adamant that he didn't do it, then he should have stayed in the job and said, well, this wasn't something that I did at all it's all a lie and would have just gone back to ba um, to doing his job and then that's it I mean you know at the end of the day I mean um, if the ABC journalist wasn't willing to make an issue out of it then he could have stayed in his job and and not um, had to resign at all if he was so um, adamant that he didn't do it so and then to say that he's going to sue for defamation now i mean it, it just seems to me that is i just don't understand what what his thinking is really in in, in um in this uh matter i mean um that, that's all really i i'm just really confused i mean um first of all with the fact that he decides to um to stand down when he's really adamant that he didn't do anything wrong um that doesn't make much sense and I know that there was people in the party possibly pushing this because they might have thought that it was bad optics. So uh, they, you know, chose the opportunity to roll him. But um, he was ahead in the polls. I mean, he was definitely, I would have thought, going to win the next election. Um, a sad thing, I, I know Tim mentioned that he was um, um, at some stage looking to be more of a moderate kind of old school Labour, right? But then closer... Um, or more recently, they have um, started to uh, throw hints out there that they would uh, start to turn um, to a more progressive kind of uh, um, policy line um, in, in regards to decriminalising abortion and also um, um, in matters like safe schools and, and so forth. So it seemed like they were starting to change their tune a little bit closer to election day. But nevertheless, I don't think uh, changing leaders is going to really change the party. Um, but the, the question of the matter is why did he choose to step down when he didn't do anything wrong? And also why is this, um, matter, if it wasn't reported at the time, made a big issue now, all of a sudden, um, in, and in the way that it happened, I mean, what was behind it? Was there some sort of, you know, something in the background that we don't know of. There could have been some blackmail or, or something that occurred uh, for this to, to get out. I'm not sure, but this is just the questions in my head right now. Oh, absolutely. Now, one thing I will point out, though, um, Damien, is that when in the Westminster system, the idea that the alternative premier at the state level, the alternative prime minister at the federal level, if he or she has a cloud hanging over head, 
suggesting impropriety of any sort. It will scandalise the opposition party and will basically render the leader utterly impotent and unable to cut through. So regardless of whether the allegations, and we can only call them allegations at this point, are true or not, it doesn't matter. The damage has been done to Foley and it's going to take a long time for him to be rehabilitated within the New South Wales Labor Party. You know, I mean, I did actually wonder myself if there was something behind it, if perhaps a factional enemy of Foley decided to leak the rumour of this allegation to a Liberal Party um, parliamentarian just to rattle him. But you can you can never know for sure. That's the thing. You can never know for sure. But the, but the point that I'm making is that if you have a cloud over your head and such a serious allegation as sexual assault, it's not going to be it's not going to be conducive to the future of the party to stay as its leader. So he had he had no choice in effect but to step down. Still, I, I, I totally understand, Michael, where, um, where you're coming from with it. But it just, I mean, if someone is um, adamant, I mean, of not having done anything illegal or anything wrong, even though, like you mentioned, that it doesn't look good and um, when there's a cloud over their head that it's best for them to resign, that way it doesn't uh, bring, bring a bad reputation to the party. But in saying that, then when they do resign... The first thing that people think is he's guilty because he's resigned. What were you going to say, Still? No, I think that I think they're both very good points. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna weigh in too heavily on that. I think I I totally agree that it looks weak. Um, uh, but you know, if it's systemal stuff, I want to take a step back and I just want to say that this whole sexual allegation of sexual assault it's it's a new weaponized mechanism that that the left and and anyone women especially can use and actually uh, damien and I, myself were having a conversation and he put up a very good point which i've been thinking about is maybe we have to bring in some sort of legislation to say that if you if you're a woman and you've had some sort of sexual assault you have to you have to bring it in bring it up within a period of time, I don't know, six months, a year, three, three weeks, I don't know what the period of time is. But with Brett Kavanaugh in the US and, and Donald Trump saying that it's a scary time to be a young man in, 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 in America right now, and the same thing is happening here uh, because anybody can accuse anyone of everything, one accusation and you end up with a, a resignation of a, of a leader of a state. This is a very disturbing trend. So if you have, you can have a political assassin it just says one thing, oh, he, he, he or she touched me or, or whatever, and then you or an automatic resignation. This is a strategic bumble that has to be sorted out. I just want to pick you up there, Steele, because I think that there's a huge difference between this incident and the, um, uh, the Blasey Ford uh, allegation against uh, Brett Kavanaugh, where it was only when Brett Kavanaugh uh, came to be uh, nominated for the Supreme Court, did she uh, come forward and say that uh, oh, he uh, assaulted me at this party 35 years ago, a party which nobody could remember, she couldn't remember, and let, let's remember with, with this one, uh, I mean, Ashley Raper, she wasn't opportunistic she she didn't want uh, to to go public to, to to put herself up to, to public judgment in fact there there was a lot of people in the the liberals and and conservatives saying oh they're the ABC and the Labour Party they're actually conspiring together to cover up that Luke Foley uh, did this uh, indecent uh, act and uh, they're they're running protection for him that was the the allegation there and the fact that she didn't want to come forward and it was only because of the public pressure because uh, David Elliott had raised it in Parliament that she felt she had to uh, address it and the fact that Foley denied denied everything and then said he was going to uh, resign and then went back on his word to say that I'm not going to resign due to uh, legal uh, reasons. It, it doesn't sound like she wants to be opportunistic uh, at all and the fact that her statement is 
oh there's a there's a witness to it as well and it goes into all the all the detail like she she remembers it uh completely i think i i believe her i think that yeah in this case i do hashtag believe women um yeah and i'm not just saying that because foley is of the 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 labor party i mean you can you you can make a judgment in this you know i'm not uh, you know i full you know like uh, mra where uh you just don't believe uh women uh, at all i I, th I think in this in this situation you can make a judgment here that you know she uh, sh she has begrudgingly come forward to, to clear this up and say okay this is what happened because there's this huge firestorm so that, that that's how i see the situation I'm not, I'm not saying I'm not saying I don't believe her either. I was just taking a, a step back and having a look at the the broader context of all of these allegations. I I I, uh, I think there's probably a lot of truth. I mean, when you say it in Parliament, you say it under oath, uh, and and once and once it's in that sacred institution, then it, all of the issues start to come up. Um, uh, my, my, that wasn't the point of my argument, but I I I I, I understand in this case there is special scenario, but. As a broader context, it's an assassination tool, and we're seeing it more and more used against, well, high, higher and higher political officials. I still don't agree with. Um, I don't. I don't think that comment is warranted in this situation. I think this is a a completely different situation. Like, yes, it was weaponized by the liberals, but it wasn't weaponized in the sense that it was confected. Okay. All right. And so, yeah, uh, this is, this is, I mean, going back forever, I guess, affairs and divorce and rape allegations and, and, and uh, sexual misconduct has been something in politics forever. So I, I guess historically it's nothing new. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, that, that's, I think it's just interesting. So Labor has uh, elected a, a new leader, Michael Daly, who was Luke Foley's uh, deputy, and they've elected uh, Penny Sharp, a, a, a MLC from the the upper house. She is uh, far left of the the Labor Party, and Michael uh, Michael Daly has said that oh, I want to uh, start with a with a clean slate. We're not going to get into this political mudslinging and it was it's all it's all uh david elliott and the the berejiklian and government's fault for like getting getting this dirty and so he's trying to labor is doing their most to wash their hands clean of luke foley he he said he was going to remain in the parliament but when he saw that he was going to be uh disendorsed uh, this is what labor do best like they 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 defend their mates for as much as possible you know the solidarity thing but as soon as it looks like they're gone they're just discarded like that so foley he's he, he, he his reputation is now mud in the in the labor party which is probably why he's launching this defamation action is because he is pretty much uh, that, that's the only sort of th th thing that he's got up his sleeve to try and save his or reputation is his marriage because uh you know if you're the f a wife of somebody who's done this i mean you're not going to be too uh too pleased well, that's true as well. I mean, politicians' wives have to be some of the most patient and saintly women you will ever meet. A lot of, and I should probably choose my words carefully here, it is suspected that a lot of politicians' wives and a lot of business people's wives, for that matter, will turn a blind eye as long as nobody else finds out about it. It was that one from the show The Crown with um, Claire Foy and Matt Smith as um, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip. You know, I will understand. I can look the other way sometimes. The thing is, though, when it becomes public, you can't look the other way anymore. And then you decide, now, you've done this. You were caught. You've been found out. We're done. So... Yeah, he is going to, Luke Foley is going to definitely try and salvage his marriage out of this because it's, it's the only thing he can do left. Now, we saw a new political marriage in Australian politics. Uh, Pauline Hanson, leader of One Nation, has now had uh, Mark Latham, former federal uh, Labor leader, join as their New South Wales uh, 
head of their division and he'll be number one on the the ticket at the the march uh 2019 election for for one nation for the legislative council and given that one nation is polling at around eight percent in new south wales mark latham looks like he'll get an eight-year term and the the state's <laughs> upper house so mark latham will be uh, a politician again now mark latham he's been in Labour, then he was with the, the Liberal Democrats for a while, now he's with uh, One Nation. And let's uh, remember that Mark Latham, he was fired from the Financial Review, he was fired from Sky News, he left uh, Rebel Media and Pauline Hanson's fallen out with a number of people over her 20 year existence. So everyone is already saying this all end in tears, this political marriage, uh, it's just a matter of time. And it's almost like they want to put up like a a betting bo uh, board about, oh, when's the time they're going to fall out? <laughs> I'd be lying if I said I wasn't thinking of that, if I wasn't, if I said I wasn't one of those people, Tim. Uh, <laughs> but there are other reasons why I'm sceptical of the new unholy alliance between Latham and Hanson. And don't misunderstand me, I actually quite like Mark. This isn't me having a go at him. I just don't think it's a very wise or prudent move on his part to join One Nation. Yes, Mark Latham does sympathise with some of One Nation's policies, but at the same time, he doesn't like being told what to do. So, and, you know, the evidence of that has already happened where you saw the interview that Joe Hildebrand did with... Um, yeah, Paul Studio Hansen. 10. Yeah, where there was the <laughs> empty chair of Mark Latham where they didn't... <laughs> oh, I, I, I saw them together on heaps of media throughout the day. I mean, they, they quit... Like, that was just the one that they messed up. They got every other one right. I mean, you know, give them a break. Oh, Yeah. Uh, there, were, there was a joke from a source, I won't confirm who my source is, obviously, but uh, this particular source suggested that he was actually just down the road from the studio. So you could be right. It could have been a um, he didn't realise what the time was and that's why he missed the interview. Or it could have been, I'm just going to take my time. They'll wait for me. They'll, they won't start without me. Maybe that's what he thought as well. I don't know. We'll have to ask him. Thing is, though, you can imagine how upset Pauline would have been with Mark. The very first media appearance scheduled for the day, and he misses it because oh, of yeah. either time error or because he decided he wouldn't be fashionably late. Whatever the case, she would be furious. Not to mention James Ashby he would also be livid with rage because he was the guy who, a few months ago, was saying, you know, Mark Latham should take over One Nation once Pauline retires. So you can imagine the fury on his face as well. Yeah. Maybe Mark thought that that, that chair was going to break. That, that's why he didn't turn up. Well, it is Channel 10 and they have had to cut, 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 uh, cut costs, so you never know. <laughs> Sorry, that's mean. I don't, I don't know. I Look, I, I like I said, I think it's a bad idea. But to be honest, I don't think anyone is really surprised that Latham decided to join One Nation. I mean, even the Liberal Dems were suspect, Liberal Democrats rather, were suspecting it for a while. I so mean, he never had a leadership that. position with, with them. He was just an ordinary uh, party member. He still did his own appearances and spouted his own views, often contradicting uh, Liberal Democrat uh, policies. So sort of the, the sort of, uh, he, he wasn't really close to them. Mm -hmm. He was on good terms with them, certainly, but as in terms of policy, he wasn't a true believer, as it were. Mm. You've got to remember the you've got to remember about Mark Latham is he's a very very smart man. He knows he generally knows what he's talking about, and he's very set in his ideas. He has be he has the capacity to refine and recalibrate his ideas, and he has done so. I mean, you look at his earliest. Um, works and he will freely admit to anyone that he needs to revise uh, what he wrote say 20 years ago and put out a new edition of whatever book it is that he wants to rewrite and he's written a few books by the way so 
I, I, the motivation for him joining One Nation, I don't think it's a purely. I don't think it's. Oh, I don't think he sees. I don't think he sees it as a way to get back into Parliament. I mean, that's a bonus for him, of course. But I don't think that's the reason he did it. I think he was just frustrated that he knew that they weren't going to roll um, David L- Leyenhelm from his number one Senate spot and thought, you know, New South Wales will be easier. Ironically, mind you, Leyenhelm has now decided that he's probably going to run for the Legislative Council in New South Wales. So, you know, the the Lib Dems and One Nation will have their two most um, fiery orators in the Legislative Council, potentially, which will be extremely amusing if you're in New South Wales and to us mm-hmm. political pundits as well. I've met, I've met Mark on a few occasions. I actually met him uh, the, the most recent time I saw him uh, was at Liberty Fest when the Unshackled was sponsoring Liberty Fest. And uh, he's incredibly smart. I, Smythe took the uh, words right out of my mouth. Incredibly smart. And I think he's going to use this as a, as a mechanism to, uh, you know, ride, ride up on this populist wave. Um, I, I, I have a soft spot for him because he, he's pushed back or, or he, he pushes back on political correctness. He pushes back on all the right issues. Um, you know, he uh, went right down the line, ticks all the boxes. So I think, I think that he's doing this to. I think, I think that he, you know, he might, he might be going for a little bit of a coup uh, within the party. I've seen that round um, that he might be pushing to take over the party. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how how right that is. I don't think. I don't think he wants to take over the party. I think he wants to get into parliament. And I think he wants to voice the issues and voice the concerns. That a lot of uh, the unshackled viewers and uh, that we as conservatives all have and all share, um, because they're not getting through. If you look at Malcolm Turnbull's Q and A uh, uh, video um, that he just did recently, he said the three the three most safe the three safest liberal seats uh, that's the Liberal Party seats uh, have fallen to independents who are more liberal than the Liberal Party. So Australia, you know, it, it, we are, we, we are, he's strong on immigration, he's strong on security, he's strong on uh, anti-political correctness, he's strong on free speech, he's strong on these issues. And I think he would jump into any party that enabled him to voice these concerns and these issues that we have as conservatives within parliament itself. Well, I wouldn't go quite as far as to say he's a man of the people, but actually, you know what? Yeah, I would say it. he is a man of the people. He actually knows what people want and it's it's not surprising that he has not only rehabilitated himself but has actually gained more even more popularity now than he had when he um up until the moment where he had that infamous handshake with john howard in 2004 Uh, Damien? Sorry, Damien, you were going to say something? Yeah, yeah, I actually think um, ideologically, I mean, he, I mean, there would be no other party that would uh, best suit him. I mean, um, I, when, back when uh, he was with the LDP, I always um, was saying in comments uh, on social media that, I didn't understand why he hadn't joined a party like One Nation because it would have definitely suited his ideas a lot more. And um, when when he did, it definitely wasn't a surprise to me. I think it's going to be really interesting uh, come the, the election coming up next year. Uh, more than anything, the minor parties that are contesting in New South Wales, it's going to be a big battle. I think... I mean, you've got Mark Latham now in One Nation. You've got uh, the Shooters. You've also got the CDP that are very strong and uh, also Lionhelm as well. So, I mean, it's going to be a, a big battle between all these minor parties. And, I mean, to be honest, I, I just hope that the minor parties um, get a lot of their members in from each and uh, knock down a lot of the major party ones, to be honest, because there's a lot of good people. Um, and a lot of good minor parties that are, uh, are contesting that election. So it's going to be very interesting to see what happens there. And 
I think it'll also be funny uh, when Mark Latham does get elected to see if uh, if Sky has him on for an interview. So, um, you know, it'll, it'll be interesting just it'll to see flight. how it all plays it'll out. It'll get fired again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, he can't get, yeah, blasted out of, he'll have an eight-year term, he won't get blasted out of the, of the parliament, and of course he'll have parliamentary uh, privilege as well. So if you thought uh, David Elliott uh, a really uh, stretched parliamentary privilege, privilege who we were talking about in the previous segment uh wait till uh mark uh, mark latham because let's uh, let's not remember uh latham's being sued at the moment by uh junkie turned abc journalist Os osman faruqi for calling him an uh anti-white uh racist so uh <laughs> yeah latham will certainly have a lot to say when he's in the in, in the parliament and uh we'll certainly probably see him even more than we do at the moment Mm, mm, mm. See, if Latham did succeed Pauline Hanson as leader of One Nation, heck, even I might be tempted to vote for One Nation. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But here's the thing, here's the funniest thing. When he, it, I'm going to say <laughs> when, because he's probably going to be, he's probably going to win. If he's number one on the One Nation ticket in New South Wales for the Legislative Council, he is almost certainly going to win. Him and Lanhelm are almost certainly going Guaranteed. to win. Yeah. Guaranteed? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I won't put money uh, on it. I would, I would actually, we'll to be honest, I think Lanhelm... Well, we lost you, Damien. Yeah. Oh, dear. Damien, we lost all of that. Yeah. You've got grandmas on your phone line again. To be honest. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, that's a bit yeah. better. Sorry, yeah. say all that again. Yeah. Oh. No, last year. Okay. Uh, try now. I was going to say that I think that uh, Leyenhelm will have a much uh, bigger challenge on his hand to get in. I think that... Um, one nation will definitely get um, even possibly two senators in. Um, shooters are going to find it hard because of that one nation contesting. And um, I mean, they might struggle to get the one. And I think CDP will remain with two senators too. Um, but with these minor parties contesting, it's going to be very difficult. I think, um, I mean, don't get me wrong, it would be great to have him in there, but i not totally certain that he's going to make it, to be honest. I mean, just looking at um, the spectrum of the minor parties and just um, unless, like I said earlier, that they were able to take down a lot of the major party senators and, and all the minor parties get a big vote, um, that would be excellent. But I think a lot of Liberal voters would have to turn to LDP for that to happen. So, I mean, they have to get a pretty decent uh, proportion vote to get in, I think. <laughs> Mm -hmm. you, you might be right there. Um, whereas Latham already has the appeal from um, being not only now a member of One Nation, but also from old Labour types who, mm. despite his status as, how did Richo call him? A king rat? Yeah. He would still have a lot of quiet sympathy from, and very, 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 very quiet support from old Labour types, which Latham himself was. But it'll be interesting how the Labour Party and the Legislative Council will res will, will respond to him being elected. They'll be like, rat, rat, and he'll <laughs> turn around and use the C word and under parliamentary privilege. It'll be great. It's like yeah. the, uh, the, 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 represent the councillor from whatever region is asked to retract and withdraw that statement. No, Mr. President, I won't. I would do no such thing. <laughs> and then you know he'll probably get ejected on his first day for an hour or two. <laughs> but you can imagine how much fun it would be. Yeah. I actually want to go down to New South Wales just for the swearing in of Mark Latham, just to see all the gnashing and gritting of teeth. But that the, the, the swearing in <laughs> or or swearing and the swearing in of him, you know, because um, <laughs> no, I mean like swearing. His, um, both. Oh, that too. <laughs> that too, that too. 
Yeah, I think that political marriage, I think it will last. Everyone's saying, well, they're in different states. Uh, Pauline, she, she runs the show in Queensland. Mark, well, with Brian Burston gone, Mark's got free reign in New South Wales. So, yeah, I think they'll be a force for a while. But uh, we've run out of time. I think this uh, roundtable format, we, we did all right, didn't we? Yeah, I really, really love this. Uh, that was, that was uh, great, great work all around. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it yeah, too. Definitely. Yep. Yeah. Oh, it's been good to also catch up with all of you at the at the same time, and uh, I'll have you all back on the show, if not in this format, then individually, like uh, I usually do. So thanks again for all coordinating at the at the same time, so we can discuss what are pretty uh, important developments. Mm. Thank you very Thank you, much, sir. Tim. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah. Thanks mm. for having me. Thanks, Tim. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. Please remember that the Gavin McGuinness Australian Tour has now been moved to December and now, now include anti-Islam activist and British values campaigner Toby Robinson. It is being billed as the Deplorables Tour. Tickets for Gavin's tour have been converted to Deplorables tickets, visiting the same cities. If you haven't got your tickets yet, you can go to the new tour website, which is thedeplorables.com.au. The Victorian state election is being held on Saturday the 24th of November, so join us for another election night live stream starting at 6pm Australian Eastern Daylight Savings Time when the polls close. Join me on Facebook and YouTube live along with my panel which will be the Young Conservative, David Hiscock from XYZ and Mangus O'Mallon. It is shaping up to be a closely fought election with the campaign now in full swing, so the result will certainly be interesting to watch. If you want to take a stand against Antifa violence, there is another free speech rally happening in Melbourne, hosted by the Australian Freedom of Speech Movement, happening on Saturday the 1st of December at 12pm in the Melbourne CBD. Also remember, we can only do this with your support, and the best form of support is always becoming a patron at patreon.com slash theunshackled. Or like many of you have been doing, sending us a direct contribution via our PayPal link, which is paypal.me slash theunshackled, which all goes a long way. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.